Greetings, horror fans. I'm Ghastly. I'm Gruesome. And this is the Graveyard Ghouls. Today, we're going to be talking about The Twilight Zone. Now, this is based off an idea. Sci-Fi has a marathon um, of uh, The Twilight Zone, the original series Twilight Zone episodes, every every single New Year. But we couldn't do it in time for New Year's, so we're doing it now. We did Krampus on New Year's. The Twilight Zone, it was originally created by Rod Serling uh, in an attempt to mix his love from his childhood of television serial... Uh, pulp stories, you know, crime, grit, scary stuff, suspense, with his wanting to produce a television show that dealt with contemporary to his time, and to a degree to our time, themes such as racism, politics, uh, society, in human nature. And so he created The Twilight Zone with a, a bit of doing. It came out in, what was it, 59? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, first season came out in 15, 1959 uh, on CBS. It was a black and white show. Uh, not every episode was written by Sterling, but most were. Uh, several were directed by other people. He did the intro to everything, though. He has that iconic voice and appearance. You are entering another dimension. Yeah, and I, and notably, he was nervous about being on camera a lot. He didn't think he'd be good at it. Yeah. Which is weird, because... He just has a... Well, he just... And he's perfect for the narrator, because he just has a stoic way of delivering things. He he's seems, just introducing the piece. He just seems so detached. Clinical, almost. And and it's honestly the best way for it. And, and there have been others who have tried to do the uh, host format... And they With varying degrees of success. Varying degrees of success, all because I think they're trying to do something or they're trying to recreate. We're something. gonna come to this in the 2019 one, where for all of his credits, um, Peel, when he's doing the narration, sounds like he's trying to be scary. Yeah. Oh, but I, I I'm not like, like he's good. He's good at, at a lot of things, but when he's doing the narration, he sounds like he's trying to be scary. Whereas Rod Serling just sounded scary because he was so matter of fact. Okay. Um. That's why I feel like a lot of other things that have been successful, like Tales from the Crypt worked because the Crypt Creek Keeper. Yeah. It's not a guy, it's this creepy, evil Muppet. You're not, it doesn't take itself seriously, so it's just, oh, okay, sure, I believe that, that's the Crypt Keeper. We're getting off topic. Okay. <laughs> let's, let's reel so it what back. Are we, what are we doing with this? We decided to do... A, Six episodes from the original series. One episode from the 1980-something series. Hold on. Let's pull it The 1985 out. revival. We're doing one episode from the 85 revival. One episode from the 2002 revival. We're doing several segments from the movie. When did the movie come out? The movie? We didn't look that up. Uh, let's look it up. Just uh, hang on. Pull up the. So we're doing a, a couple of segments from the movie. We'll talk about that one when we get to that. Oh, I can just pull it up right here. Okay. Uh, movie, 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 movie. Uh, 1983. Okay, we're doing a couple seconds from the 1983 movie, uh, which we'll do before the 2002 revival, so it's in chronological order. And then we're doing an episode from the 2019 revival, uh, Jordan Peele. And what we decided on was we each picked three episodes, but with the revivals and the movies, we wanted to try to show some of the remakes. Because each revival would do some original stuff with varying degrees of success, but there were certain classic episodes from the original that people keep coming back to. Um, notably, the original series were doing Nightmare at 20,000 Feet with the gremlin on the wing. Uh, and then in the 2002 revival, we're doing Monsters on due on, are Due on Maple Street, uh, which is a remake of the original Monsters Are Due on Maple Street. Then we're doing from... another version of Nightmare at 20,000 Feet in, the, in movie. the movie, and then in the 2019 revival, Nightmare at 30,000 Feet. Which I guess might be a sequel or a remake? I'm, not, even I'm sure. not sure. I haven't seen this one yet. I'm looking forward to it. Mm-hmm. What I do know is the original, and we're not watching the original one, Yeah. but in the original series, the episode call, was called The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street. Yeah. The remake retitled the name The Monsters Are On Maple Street. Which is one of those little ominous things where you can change a couple <laughs> of words and it makes it creepy. Like, um, you know, you know the the world's shortest horror story. Mm-hmm. Uh, the world's shortest horror story is in a room all alone sat the last man on earth, and there was a knock on the door. Oh yes, you told me this before. 
And you can make it an entirely different kind of horror story by changing one word. In a room, all alone, sat the last man on earth. And there was a lock on the door. That's a different kind of scary. <laughs> I argue that's almost worse. Cool. Uh, all right. So, yeah, from the original series, we're going to be watching The Living Doll, Kick the Can, The Masks, Nightmare at 20,000 Feet, Death Head Revisited, and Will the Real Martian Please Stand Up? And we'll be seeing some of Sterling's social commentary, straight horror, regular sci-fi, and... Uh, Touching on contemporary issues, as well as just doing, let's do creepy stuff. Uh, so what do we have up first? The Living Doll. We have The Living Doll. That was from Season 5, Episode 6, and it was directed by Richard C. Serafian. Uh, cool, notable things about this is Telly uh, Savalas, the angry-ass dad, uh, he's um, Blofeld in On Her Majesty's Secret Service, <laughs> the, uh, the one George Lazenby Bond movie. No, Mr. No, that's not, I was going to say no, Mr. Bond, I, I expect you to die, but that's, that's Goldfinger, not Blofeld. Yeah. Um, and June, for card. June Foray is Talkie Tina. Do you know who she is? <clears throat> No, I feel like I should, but I don't. She's the grandmother from Mulan. <laughs> no, I'm not. This is look at her IMDb page. <laughs> she was also Wheezy the the Weasel from Who Framed Roger Rabbit and the, the Rocky and the Adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle movie and Lucifer in Cinderella. Oh, Lucifer the Cat in Disney Cinderella. I was like, when the hell does the devil show up in Cinderella? Lucifer the Cat. Lucifer the Cat. <laughs> Someone has to do the noises, I guess, yeah. Okay, cool. That's so, uh, really cool. I uh, thought that was fun. <laughs> that is fun. So up first, uh, The Living Doll. See you guys after the short. So yeah, that was uh, the living doll. Uh, what was it you just said about the doll? I hate staring at that thing. <laughs> I hate it, especially at the end of the episode when it's just frozen in place and in front of the credits. I, I think that that's the one I remember terrifying. This is the one that terrified me the most as a kid. It was right up there for me. I don't know if it was the most, but it was right up there. And the, it, it wasn't the thing about inanimate objects, because otherwise I would have also thought that Dummy was one of my scariest ones, but yeah. honestly, that one didn't scare me as much as it made me think. Um, it's about the voice. The it's voice. A, the voice of Talkie Tina. Right. Part of it's the voice. Part of it's the weird ambiguity of the situation, because at first it makes you think maybe the husband is just cracking up. Yeah. But then the doll's indestructible. Yeah. And then the doll talks to the wife. I mean... Chucky and Annabelle have nothing. I, I caught that halfway through. It's kind of it's funny, isn't it, that that the wife in this episode about a murderous living doll is named Annabelle. It's really a pre considering the horror movie Annabelle later on. Yeah, it really is a precursor to a lot of ideas, certainly. And it did it better than that. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to give Child's Play credit where credit is due. A lot of the best scares in that movie come early on when you're still not sure if the doll is alive or if. It's the little girl doing it and blaming it on the doll. Once Chucky reveals himself as, I'm Chucky, the living doll, it's still scary, but he's hamming it up so much it becomes a, a goofier film. Yeah. And with Annabelle, Annabelle's a case study in what not to do with a scary doll. It's based on a real, actual, honest-to-God doll that people think is haunted because every single person who's owned it has died horribly. Yeah. But the scary thing about the real Annabelle doll is it's a Raggedy Ann doll. You can see it in the museum. It's just a very old, slightly dirty Raggedy Ann doll. And that's terrifying because those things used to be everywhere. It's just your average random doll. It'd be like thinking that a Barbie doll was cursed. You'd never see it coming. Whereas the movie Annabelle doll, you take one look at the thing and go, oh, well, that's cursed. Yeah. They designed an evil doll that you'd never give to a child. And this one, of course, kind of, kind of looks dirty at the end, but it takes a lot of abuse throughout the episode. At the beginning, it just looks like a normal doll. If you're scared of dolls, it'll creep you out with its rictus grin, but it's just a doll. Yeah. 
with that slightly unnerving voice that becomes more and more unnerving the more it threatens to kill people. Yeah, and it's the thing that it says, and the way that... I, uh, I gotta give credit to the actor who plays the father... <laughs> He he just he you you believe he's terrified. Of he's he, you're, he's good at reacting and and that's what well, acting is reacting. Yes, <laughs> uh, happen <laughs> whatever. Um, <laughs> what's great is and you know it was, it was a lot of good Twilight Zone episodes with a lot of things Rod Sterling worked on. Sterling knew how to tell a story. He could do twists better than anyone. He wrote the um, I don't know if he wrote it exclusively or if he worked on it. The original Planet of the Apes. Yeah. To his mind, a good story should set up a question yeah. and then answer that question at the end in a way that is interesting. And at the beginning, the question set up is, is the doll really alive and threatening the father of the house, or is it just a delusion brought on based on his feelings of inadequacy because he married a woman with a daughter and is himself impotent and can have no children of his own, and therefore he feels threatened by this doll, implicitly another child that he had no say in being brought into the house. Yeah, a lot of... I... <laughs> and at the end, the answer is, well, that's why he hates it, but it actually is alive, and it's going to kill him. Yes. <laughs> but the creepiest thing about this episode was never it just threatening the father. It was the ending, because it... Im- when she says, you better be nice to me... To the mother. It implies that she'll do this to anybody who crosses her, not just a dad with a bad morality complex. Yeah. Well, and then, and then Sterling comes in saying the doll is, like, the girl's defender. But the problem is, if you're a little kid, you think you need defending from a lot of things you don't. This gets touched on in another episode, uh, It's a Good Life. If you give the power of God to a bratty nine-year-old... His sense of justice or helping people is going to be screwed up as hell. Guardian angel of a tiny child is a doll with the morality of a tiny child. Oops. <laughs> Alrighty. That's spooky. Or, or there is no deeper meaning, it's just a creepy doll. There's deeper meaning, though. It's Rod Sterling. We're going to get to episodes with, deeper, with no deeper meaning uh, later on. What's up next on the, the retinue? We're going to put the list. Uh, I have it right here. You have it right here. Yeah. I have it right here. Uh, up next, we're going to do Kick the Can. Ooh, fun. This one plus spooky, isn't it? Oh, yeah. It's be- It's a beautiful one. I and love dude, it. For every, for every ten spooky episodes, he'd do, he'd do a moving one. All right. Kick the Can, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, that was the original Kick the Can. It was directed by Lamont Johnson. It was from Season 3, Episode 21 of the original Twilight Zone. So this isn't really one of his scary ones. No, not even a little bit. It's sad at the end, It's kind of sad. It is kind of sad at the end, but it's one of my favorites. And it's really just because of these two incredible... Primary actors playing um, uh, Charlie and who's the other? Charlie one? and Benny. Benny. Oh my God! And just two like I I can't name they name a lot of stuff they've done because they were old they were old actors in the 1950s. Yeah. So like a lot of their stuff is way before our time. <laughs> um, well, okay. Let's be honest. The 1950s are way before our time. Yes. <laughs> Granted. Um, so, but it's just it's just wonderful dialogue that they're both. 60s, actually. If this was season three, it would have been the early 60s. Yeah, they're just both engaged in this wonderful dialogue throughout the piece. And you believe that they're old friends. Yeah, you Even believe one of them has gotten a little more bitter and stubborn in his old age. I'm. It reminds me of something that Ray Bradbury would write. Because because the, the angry one, he's not even he's not even that aggressive. He's he's not even angry. He's just made his peace with growing old and he's set in his ways. And he's really and he's really he's worried. He's concerned for his friend. He thinks his friend is going senile. But he doesn't want his friend, you know, to be locked up alone or anything, but he, he doesn't believe that kick the can will make you young again. And then depressingly he gets left behind when everyone else is made young again because he wouldn't play. Uh, which I just I love I love the pure optimism of the one character, yeah, and and Charlie. to the just 
Have you read anything by Ray Bradbury? Because this no. felt very. This felt like something from his. Um, his he did a, a, a spiritual Is trilogy. Is Ray Bradbury? Is that Fahrenheit four fifty one? Yes, but that's not the sort of thing I'm thinking of. This okay, yeah. Of something that is his, though. This reminded me of something like Dandelion Wine or Something Wicked This Way Comes, the small town, friends in summer kind of feeling. Right. You could see, um, and we'll watch the version, the Disney film version of Something Wicked This Way Comes on our show at some point, but you could see um, the two boys from that one growing up to be something like these two men in this, in this show. Now, and I think Wicked even has a, uh, an aging thing going on in it, too. I mentioned during the episode we should play these roles as old men. <laughs> uh, but I think it I would be... See it. I think fun. it would be fun as a scene exercise. Yeah. It's just quick material. But it is. Like, well, it's, it's... I mean, there were some stinkers, but most Twilight episode zones from the classic one. Most Twilight Zone episodes from the classic ones are great material. Speaking of, uh, th- this is just a bonus fact, um, one of my um, middle school history teachers, um, he, he was talking to me, his name was Mr. Terry, um, if he's out there and he's, and he's somehow listening to this hello, um, I doubt you are, I doubt you're even remotely interested, <laughs> um, but. but he was, uh, he was, he was one of my favorites, uh, and he mentioned that, uh, Rod Serling came to his school and did like a um, and did like a, um, a speech once and cool. he, to his university and they, and he spoke and it was and I'm just like wow really so, cool. So what else is this directed? Because this was directed by Lamont Johnson. There's a couple of Lamont Johnsons, but the one who directed this also uh, directed. Let's see. The Broken Chain from 1993, Voices Within from 1990. Uh, oh, he directed Lincoln. He directed Lincoln? Not the one you're thinking of. He directed the 1988 pro- production of Lincoln. Oh. <laughs> I'm like... <laughs> I only brought that up because I knew that it would be your reaction. Yeah, his version of Lincoln. <laughs> um, Thanks for yeah. subverting my expectations, Peter. Yeah, no, his came out in 1988. Okay, what's what's next on our little... Uh, the Masks. Agenda? Ooh, The Masks from Season 5, Episode 25. We're getting back into the horror, people. Directed by Ida Lupino. Now, this one's good. This one's a good horror. It's a good self-contained episode. It's a good social commentary. And also, and I'm going to touch on this after we've watched it, it's a good example of strong characterization... Because he does a couple of the writers and the director do some things with this so that you know everything you need to know about the characters very early on. And considering he only has a half hour to show you these people, it's important that you know who you're dealing with. It's a, it's a good small scale vital episode because it only takes place in one room. Yeah. Which, alright, let's, let's launch into it. The Masks. All right, that was the masks. So I said at the beginning of this about characterization in a short time, and the interactions between the old man and his doctor, and then the interactions between the doctor and the butler, and the butler and the maid, are important. Because we learn from this very quickly that A, this man's servants respect him. He's a very old, very rich man, and his butler and his maid have respect for him. And his doctor is valued because of his candor, and even though he's willing to speak rudely to the doctor, and even though the doctor says the first time they met he threw a lamp at him, the doctor respects him, and even likes him. And these same servants instinctively dislike the family. We know they've met them before, and we know that they don't like him. If we didn't know all of these things... If they just showed us him getting his revenge on the family with those enchanted masks, there's a very good chance he'd just come off as a bitter, dying old man who wanted to play a mean, cruel joke. Oh, yeah. But we know that he isn't. We know that they deserve it. I love this, though, because specifically because of the way he's ruthless to the family. And because every single one of those lines is funny, 
But because you know the underlying part of them is, oh, it's all true. It's Wilfred, all true. I believe if they cut you open, they'd find a cash register inside. <laughs> uh, he doesn't read books, he feels them. He doesn't look at paintings, he appraises them. Yeah, well, the, and the thing is, though, at the end, when he's dying, when he's visibly collapsing in on himself... Yeah. And they're asking him about the mask, and he says, is there nothing else you have to say to me? Yeah. They never once actually comfort him. The minute he's dead, they're celebrating because they're rich. And she has, and... and Her he, hypochondria, like the... He mentions their, her hope. Oh, in her voice. A yeah. of hope in your voice, When she finally. says, are you feeling weaker, father? Or, or, or even before the boy, no, he's not a boy, but the, the Wilfred Jr. out and out admits that he used to torture animals, the dull look on his face and the fact that he's always chewing at his thumb or, or, or playing with a wheelchair like as a rocking horse tells us this isn't a grown adult, this is a man-child. Yes. And the daughter, she's always looking in the mirror. It's, none of this is him being unnecessarily cruel. It's all set cruel, up in a very short people. amount of time, and it all adds up very quickly. So you get it almost immediately. You know why he's doing what he's doing. You know what sort of people these are. Everything beyond that is confirmation and then payoff. And it's a good payoff. And it's 25 minutes. They don't explicitly say it, but you get the sense that if he hadn't been right about them, if they hadn't been such awful people, the masks wouldn't have changed them. Yeah. Because his mask doesn't change him. He's wearing a death mask of a skull. And, and the he, doctor says, you know, this is death, just peace, no horror, no grotesquery. And that's why his face is the same. Yeah. But no, they really were, as he said, even without the masks, you're... Except that's not what he says. I was about to say, even without the masks, you're caricatures. But what he says is, you're caricatures... Without your masks, your caricatures. Yeah. The implication being that the ma the masks didn't give them grotesque faces as the masks. Their normal human faces were the masks of the ugliness inside them. Oh, yeah. Brilliant it, stuff. I like that he sets it up uh, to tease them, though. And he sets it up. You're supposed to wear the antithesis of, of what yourself. You, of yourself. And, of course, Wilfred lists off all these, you know, I'm an affable fellow, I'm friendly. And, of course, he's like, of course he's not. And so he gets to call them out on every single one of their character flaws while pretending to be the, the, the doting old man that says, oh, of course you're not this cruel, warped, shallow, petty-minded thing. No, you're the opposite of that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and he didn't force them. They could have taken the masks off at any time. They just wouldn't have gotten his money. Yeah, he's like... the only reason they were there. Yeah. So they, they deserve it. It's a cruel fate, but they deserve it. Yes. Okay, what have we got next? Uh, we got Nightmare at 20,000 feet. This was from Season 5, Episode 3. A lot of Season 5 ones. I think after Season 4, where they were pushed by the network to go to an hour-long format with mixed results and a lot of padding, they really wanted to go out on a bang with Season 5, and that's probably why we got so many Season 5 ones. Yeah, and and by this, by no means is this just our favorites or anything. This isn't a greatest hits even. These were just the ones we thought that we could say something interesting about. Yeah. Or that got touched on enough later that it was worth the comparison. If we tried to do our favorites or even our greatest hits, we'd be here all night. There's so many episodes. I mean, they did five seasons. They did five seasons, and we have several revivals to get through. Honestly, you could count the number of bad original series episodes on two hands. Yeah. So there's so many really good ones. And there's a lot of ones that are just, they're good. They aren't memorable, but they're, they're good. You watch them, you enjoy them, you forget them. But some you really remember, and we're trying to think of the ones that you really remember and that you can talk about. Mm -hmm. So up next, directed by Richard Donner, Nightmare at 20,000 Feet from Season 5. It's Episode 3. Who was Richard Donner? What did he do? Oh, yeah. He, he did something interesting, didn't he? Yeah. He, hmm. it's, a, it's a name that I recognize. Yeah. If not, it's just because of it. It's kind of... pointed it out. What did he do? Uh, bah, um... He directed The Twilight Zone, and... Oh, Superman... The Omen. He directed The Omen. He directed The Omen? Yeah, that was what it was. When we first brought this episode up for watching, you said, what else did Not he do? Not this guy? 
That guy, exactly. Oh. He directed Superman. And The Omen. And The Omen and Lethal Weapon. And The Goonies. And The Goonies? Oh my god. Yeah, this guy's prolific. And of course he would do... Listen, uh, before we watch this, if you haven't seen Nightmare 20,000 Feet, you've seen it parodied. They parodied it in The Simpsons. The Tiny Toons parodied it. <laughs> the Looney Toons parodied it. Everyone is, if you've ever heard someone say, There's a gremlin on the wing! That's this. There's a little man on the wing! That's this. So, and of course, the, the obvious joke during the 90s, they did this in The Simpsons, they did this in The Tiny Toons, if you say there's a gremlin on the wing, someone will go, Oh, don't worry, they don't use that much gas. <laughs> because it was a car that went right over my head when the Tiny Toons did it. Um, actually, yeah. So let's um, let's watch Nightmare Twenty Thousand Feet. Okay, so Nightmare at Twenty Thousand Feet. This one was this one did a number on me as a kid for a couple of first off. I saw the Tiny Toons version of this before the real one. <laughs> the, the Tiny Toons Christmas special where, where the, the Tiny Toons version of Daffy Duck uh, is panicking about the gremlin on the wing. And the, um, the flight, the stewardess is like their version of Hello Nurse and keeps pummeling him every time he calls her. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the real one, let's get a couple things out of the way. The gremlin design looks goofy. It just does. Oh, yeah. The it looks like a man itself, in a bear costume. The mask itself is creepy. The face is creepy. But the actual design of the gremlin is goony as hell. Oh, I always thought it just looked like a guy, a, a full-sized man in an Ewok costume. <laughs> <laughs> that said, though, that shot when he thinks maybe it was fake, and then he pulls the curtain up, and it's staring at him, pressed up against the window, waiting for him. That's unsettling. Yeah. The guy in the suit does a pretty good job of making this thing move in a slightly animalistic way, despite the fact that he's just a guy in a big furry suit. And the premise is solid. We have a guy who suffered a nervous breakdown on an airplane, has a terror of flying, has been in a sanatorium, and has been declared cured. Now he's flying home. And he sees a monster on the wing of the airplane that no one believes is there because every time he tells them, it flies away. And then he sees it start to tamper with an engine. And no one believes him. That's frightening. This scared me, one, because of that shot of the thing in the window, and two, because I've always been scared of heights and of flying as a result of that. I have been flying ever since I was very small, so I have never had a fear or problem of flying, but... I always thought the madness of having of trying to show somebody something that exists that you know exists that you're sure exists and nobody being believes able to... you and that comes up in a lot of horror. Usually it's a child who nobody believes, but it's a grown adult in this one. Yeah, and which makes it more terrifying. And th with some good reason. I mean, if your husband, who you knew had just suffered a nervous breakdown and been released from the sanatorium, was telling you there was a man on the wing of the airplane. Because a, a kid can scream, why don't you believe me, and get away with it, because it's a kid. Yeah. A and man can just cry into his hands and be like, what's happening to me? And you, and at the end, and I'm glad they do, at the end he's vindicated. At the end, they're taking him away in a straitjacket, and he says, I know that we're safe. But for now, I'm the only one who really knows that. And then the narrator comes in and says, but they'll know soon enough, and we see that the wing of the plane has been damaged. Yeah. And I always thought to myself, yeah, maybe he'll get vindicated whenever I watch this when I was growing up. But me now is more cynical. Me now thinks, oh, they still won't believe him. They might not believe him that it was a gremlin, but they're going to believe there was something out there. Yeah. Because, okay, he, he leaned out the window and fired a gun off, but a gun wouldn't peel up a plate on the wing. Yeah. Now, I want to touch on this. A gremlin, because he mentions, you know, what were they called? Gremlins back in the war. Uh, the term gremlin actually denoting a mischievous creature that sabotages aircraft started with the Royal Air Force in the 20s, but it became a folkloric thing that would attack aircraft during World War II or War I, 
And basically, any time there was a malfunction or a plane disappearing that you couldn't explain, they'd say, "Oh, it was the gremlins." I was really confused when the, when I when I saw this af- like because I had seen this before seeing the movie Gremlins. But I also I I yeah I was very I was small about. when I saw that before seeing the movie <laughs> Gremlins. So when I returned to this after seeing the movie Gremlins, I'm like, wait. Are gremlins, like, more than one thing now? Well, the thing is, because we don't have aircraft disasters as frequently anymore, because they're better built and we're not in a war, yeah. gremlins morphed into this idea of a sort of a goblin or an imp that sabotages machinery. Okay. Which you see them doing in the movie Gremlins. A lot of their kills are them sabotaging something. Yeah. Um, my introduction to Gremlins was a Looney Tunes short where Bugs Bunny is fighting a gremlin in an old World War II bomber. That's fine. Uh, but yeah, this is this is a distinct thing from the Gremlins in Gremlins. Yeah. Uh, so we're gonna re- revisit this. We're gonna revisit the what was it the two thousand two version of this one? Yeah, uh, the two thousand no. Well, yeah, no, no. It's the going movie. to be the movie version of it. And then the twenty nineteen version. The twenty nineteen nightmare at thirty thousand feet. Which I think might be that planes fly higher now. We're gonna see. Um, Adam Scott just shoots out of a plane that's only slightly higher than the last one. <laughs> you, we, we talked about this when we were watching it, you were astounded that that was William Shatner. I was I was really surprised it was William Shatner the first time I watched through it. Now I remember it being William Shatner. But like also, I hear all these things of him being just the goofiest man on the most popular thing he was a part of in his career, which was Star Trek. Well, you gotta keep in mind... He didn't sign on to Star Trek thinking, oh, this will make my career. Nobody who signed on to Star Trek expected Star Trek to get big. (laughs) Which is the biggest, which is the primary joke in Galaxy Quest, the best Star Trek movie. Which, well... (laughs) (laughs) Everybody hate me! Here, okay, you want to be hated. Here's what I'm going to say that's going to get me hated. Yeah. Gene Roddenberry was the only guy who thought Star Trek was going to get big uh, when he made because he was the guy who made Star Trek. Right. And I'm going to say all of the best versions of Star Trek have been made without Gene Roddenberry's direct involvement. Interesting. He lost creative control of the movies after Star Trek The Motion Picture did poorly because Star Trek The Motion Picture was awful. He had limited involvement with Wrath of Khan. Other than, you know, producer. Yeah. He, the best episodes of, of The Next Generation were the ones where he wasn't directly involved in the writing. Deep Space Nine had some of the most brilliant writing in the franchise. Roddenberry was, again, only really producing at that point, and a lot of times he wasn't involved at all. Original series is goofy. I get why there's appeal, but you go back and rewatch it and it's, well, a lot of the shows from back then are goofy in that way. Yeah. Yeah. It's... The later writers and the later directors realized something that Roddenberry never would let himself believe, and that was just because humanity has advanced technologically 20, you know, 2,000 years in the future does not mean we're going to be singing Kumbaya. There is no evidence in modern, ancient, contemporary, or near history that says we are progressing towards a post-scarcity life of peace, or that even if currency didn't exist and we didn't need any physical things, we wouldn't still be at each other's throats. People are not fundamentally flower children. Yeah. The flower children weren't fundamentally flower children. It was <laughs> an ideal. I'm All right. Tangent done. All right, next up on our list, we have... Death had revisited. Yeah, all right, so this is going on. I'm gonna, one last thing about because we got on a tangent. My point was, William Shatner's actually a really good actor, but he was goofy in Star Trek because everybody was goofy in Star Trek, and in a lot of things he's in recently, he plays a parody of himself, very much like what Adam West did. Adam West was a serious actor. He got famous for a goofy, goofy role as Batman. And then he played Catman on The Fairly Odd Parents. He realized he could make a career out of just playing himself but goofy. And to be honest... If people would pay me money to just play myself but a goofball consistently, that's a good career. Good work if you can get it. I wouldn't turn it down. (laughs) All right. (laughs) So, yeah, William Shatner is good in this because he actually is a good actor. 
when given good material and good direction. Anyway, Death's Head Revisited is one of the social commentary ones, and also a horror one. It is about an SS officer revisiting an old, closed-down death camp. I've never seen this. People occasionally will ask the question, why don't we just tear down those wretched blights on the face of the earth? Why didn't we dynamite every single camp from Dachau to Auschwitz? And people were asking that when this episode came out, because the war was way fresher in people's minds. There were lots of people... Oh yeah, it was the 50s, or yeah. the 60s, are you kidding me? So That's there were people, 30 years removed. There were scores of people who had <clears throat> lived through those camps. And Rod Sterling made this episode in a large part to answer the question of why can't we just dynamite the damnable things? Let's watch Death's Head Revisited. Okay, that was Death's Head Revisited, written by Rod Sterling and directed by Don Medford. I mentioned that this was both a horror episode and an episode of social commentary, and while it is a ghost story, I think we're in agreement that the ghosts aren't the horrific part. No. Um, <clears throat> an interesting episode. <clears throat> the SS officer returns to Dachau, where he tortured and killed a bunch of... 17 million... Was it million? No, thousand. 17,000. In Dachau, under his command, according to this episode, it was 17,000 human beings were killed. Thousands were tortured. S pointless, sadistic medical experiments were authorized on women and children. And so he's been in hiding... In South America, like so many of the bastards did. Um... Under an assumed name. Yeah. And he returns to reminisce. Yeah, literally that. He comes back out it's of a per sense of It's perverse and gross and a sick motive for a character, but it's, it's... By his own words, he came back because he missed the fatherland and he wanted to revisit the good old days. And by the good old days, he means when he was the commanding officer of a death camp. And while he's there, he meets a man, Beckett, who's wearing a concentration uniform and who claims to be the groundskeeper, the caretaker of the camp, and who keeps reminding him of all the horrible things that he did and claims he's going to put him on trial. And he does with a whole bunch of other people who look harrowed and dead and in these uniforms and then the SS officer passes out, and when he comes to, he makes the realization that he killed Beckett when the Americans were going to liberate the camp. At which point Beckett says, of course he did, vanishes, and then reappears and says, oh, and by the way, you've been found guilty from our trial, and we declare the sentence that you'll be rendered insane. And the way they render him insane is they make him feel the agony of every torture he ever did to any human being in that camp all at once. Which is a horrific fate. But I, there's not a single tear that's being shed for this guy. He deserves it. I... And of course, by the end, he is rendered insane. And the whole message... And you mentioned it a bit before we started this episode in particular. The question of why don't we burn all these places to the ground, these monuments of death and suffering. And, and it's asked by a couple of characters. The, the woman at the beginning that he's intimidating, the innkeeper, thinks that it should be dynamated. The doctor who declares the SS officer insane at the end, without knowing he's an SS officer because he successfully hid his identity. Uh, he, the doctor wonders aloud why they let Dachau keep standing and why they don't burn the wretched thing. And then Rod Serling comes in and says... The, the specific dialogue is way better than anything I could 
I could assimilate to this. So I, the reason that they stand, all of them, all of the camps stand, is because they are a monument to that horror. They are a reminder that human beings did this, that the Holocaust happened, that mankind, a portion of mankind, human beings, stepped up and said, I'm going to torture and murder without reason and without cause and without restraint. And if we tear down those camps, that would be tantamount to denying that this happened. And we can't forget it happened. We can't. The worst amount, the worst thing is that people today, and they're becoming more vocal because the internet is a thing, is that there are people who deny the Holocaust. And it's... And you can't, arguing with them is 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 useless and 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 not worth your time or your effort because they're just going to think what they think. I'd argue that it is something worthwhile. You don't argue with a madman to convince the madman. You argue with the madman to convince the people listening to him. All right. A Nazi or a neo-Nazi is never going to agree with you when you say the Holocaust happened and that it was horrific. But the random guy who's also listening, who has grown up almost a century removed from this, and who maybe doesn't know, the public education system being what it is, maybe just has never heard a convincing argument, you can't allow the practiced arguments of a denier to be the only narrative. Fair enough. Hence, things like this. And it's episodes like this, which is why The Twilight Zone is so much more than, as much as I'll defend horror to the day I'm dead, it's so much more than just a horror show. It was saying something. And sometimes it wasn't. But sometimes it really was. And that's what was special about it. It was so many things, and it can do so many things. Rod Sterling wanted to combine... Sterling? Sterling, yeah, Sterling. His writing is Sterling. His name is Sterling. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, that was bad. That was terrible. <laughs> anyway. I should be strung up. <laughs> All right. But no, Sterling wanted, like I said, he wanted to combine pulp TV with genuine social commentary. So our last episode, though, is we're after the heaviness of that. Last episode of the original. Of the original, yeah. After the heaviness of that. Our last episode of the original series Will the real Slim Shady please stand up? Will the real Martian please stand up? Now, this gets referenced a lot, um, and it was originally... I gotta look up what the name of it was. This is itself a shout-out to something. Will the real... It was the, the celebrity game or something? Will the real something please stand up is, a, is an older thing that I know about. Yeah, this is one of the earliest pop culture references. The initial... Um, Reference is, I'm trying to find it. Here we go. Here we go. It's from a game show. It is from a game show from the, uh, where was it? The 50s, I believe. Um, yeah. It was called To Tell the Truth, or Truth or Consequences. And a celebrity panel had to identify which of the contestants was the real so-and-so. And then at the end, they'd say, let's say they were trying to identify the real Aaron Setlow, and there were three dudes, yeah. and they'd know certain things about Aaron Setlow, and they'd have to guess. And then at the end, the host would say, will the real Aaron Setlow please stand up? This was, as far as I know, the first pop culture reference of that, will the real Martian please stand up? And because it was a 50s show, this would have been a cheeky little thing. Um... It would have been a, contemporary audiences would have gotten what okay. he was referencing. So what's funny about that is when Marshall Mathers, uh, Eminem, Eminem did his "Will the Real Slim Shady Please Stand Up." I think it was the video where he had like a, the twelve-inch screen TV. Yeah, and he was appearing he was, on that. He I was think, referencing this. Yeah, he was. It's fascinating. Twilight Zone references to tell the truth. Slim Shady, Eminem, references Twilight Zone. And then, because 
the way the Joker has always been written is to throw random pop culture role in the comics. It's usually the Marx Brothers references. In The Dark Knight, the Joker kills a fake Batman and cuts a smile onto his face and then pins a Joker card to him that says, Will the real Batman please stand up? Referencing Slim Shady. Actually, a minor tangent, in the never-produced Batman musical... Oh, yes, you that showed me that this. Was, that was going to be directed by Tim Burton and that they never made it because um, Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark bombed, tragically. Uh, they did make the demos for it, and in the Joker's song, the Joker's song took the idea that Joker makes pop culture references and ran with it. The lyrics are 90% pop culture references, up to and including him saying, Will the real Batman please stand up? Please stand up? Please stand up? And it never got made, but I, w I wonder if the writer of The Dark Knight knew that was a thing when he slipped that little one-off gag into The Dark Knight. Yeah. I wouldn't put it past them. Okay, the real Martian please stand up is interesting for a couple of reasons. First up, it's one of the rare ones that's it's just a sci-fi story. It could arguably be a horror story, but it's just a sci-fi story. There's no commentary. It's just, hey, let's do a story about people trying to find out which one is the alien. It's also what inspired the plot of John Carpenter's The Thing, and also The Thing from Outer Space, because John Carpenter's The Thing was a remake of that, one of the few really good remakes. And John Carpenter's The Thing, in turn, inspired the plot of Quentin Tarantino's the Hateful Eight. All three of them are basically bigger and bigger budget versions of this story of a group of people who don't know each other very well are trapped in one building because of the snow, and one of them is the outsider that the others need to find out. In this case, it's a Martian. In John Carpenter's The Thing, it's The Thing. In The Hateful Eight, it's The Killer. Let's watch. Will the real Martian please stand up? Oh, I love that one. <laughs> so I knew it was... I knew it was the... Yeah, okay. Uh, so as you Spoil, said... This, spoilers for us. Uh, so for, as, uh, you, as you said... 70-year-old ass. So yeah, yeah, as you said, the setup is uh, all these people... Uh, six people got on a bus with the driver, and they went to a place. They they're stopped, at a diner. They're at a diner. Because the bridge isn't safe because of the snowstorm. And the two policemen show up, the two state troopers show up, because there was a call that something crash-landed in the local pond. And they can't see what it is under the ice, but there are footprints leading to the diner. And not counting the driver, the police officers, and the guy behind the counter at the diner, there are seven people in the diner. And that bus driver's very sure he had sex. Somebody don't belong. And it's interesting, like, the ways they try to figure it out. Ultimately, it just kind of... They don't. It's it's not easy to do. Well, because... This gets... Uh, the same problem comes up in The Thing. And the same problem comes up in The Hateful Eight. And the same problem comes up in Inside Man, even though that's not the same story. Yeah. But the problem is... Anyone who says, well, I don't remember you, even if they're right, the other guy can just say, well, I certainly don't remember you. So how do you, with any degree of certainty, determine who is the real outsider? Yeah. And this is before the lights start going on and off and the music starts playing for no reason and cups start smashing even though no one's touching them. Um, <laughs> the ending's fun, though, isn't it? Oh, yeah, the part where he has just three arms. And then one of the, the bus, the bridge does go out, and it turns out that the phone call telling them the bridge was safe was just an illusion like the lights, and the one guy who seemed beneath suspicion, honestly, even though he did consistently say this is all nonsense, yeah. it should have been a warning, comes back in, and he's like, yep, bridge went out, I'm the only one who made it, I guess I'm just lucky. And then the diner man says, well, hang on, you're not wet. And in a moment, he goes, what's wet? And then he goes to light a cigarette, and he gets the cigarette out, and he gets his lighter out, and he gets the matches out. Yeah. With three hands. Yeah. And he casually mentions that, yeah, Mars is colonizing. I think you'll like it, Mr. Ross. And then Mr. Ross goes, 
Uh, yeah, um... No, 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 it's not... Mr. Ross is the guy... Is, is behind the, the counter. Oh, Mr. Ross is the Martian. Yeah. The guy behind the counter then goes, I'm sorry, Mr. Ross, uh, your colony's been intercepted. See, us folks on Venus had the same idea, and he pushes his little paper diner hat back and reveals he's got three eyes. Yeah. <laughs> Incredible. And that threatens to kill the guy. It, it was it was fun. It was fun? Yeah, okay, it's a little goofy. I mean, they even straight up say in the middle, it's like a Ray Bradbury science fiction. Oh, yeah. It's, that's a common uh, cliche. We, we I mentioned this to you when we were watching Madoka Magica. Yeah. And one character compares another character to behaving like they're in an anime, even yeah. though the show is an anime. If a character in a work of fiction says, oh, well, it's not as if this is fiction, it establishes to us, the audience, that their world should be operating on the same rules as our world. So if those rules get broken, it's not just something that happens. Yeah. Which is important. Because in a science fiction story, geez, maybe crash landings from aliens are just something that happens. I mean, in the Star Wars or the Star Trek universe, let's look at the Star Trek universe. If a couple of Enterprise officers said, hey, somebody crash landed in the ship, you know, their ship in the pond over there, the bartender guy would have said, oh, were they from Romulus or... Yeah. So it's important that we, the audience, know that it's the real world. But yeah, it's just a sci-fi story, but very easily made horror in the thing which totally got its title from this, because they do say one of them is, a uh, Thing. Yeah. And then, hatefully, recentered it to just humans. Instead of who's the real Martian, it's who poisons the coffee. Um, but it's a, it's a good thing. It's a, a locked room mystery to a degree. All right, uh, that tears it for the original series. We've covered horror, we've covered social commentary, we've covered social commentary and horror, and we've covered just straight sci-fi. So, what do we have next? What was the what was the first attempt to recapture the lightning in a bottle? So, it was the movie, but we're going to go a little out of order at first. So, okay. we're going to do uh, the 1985 revival. Gotcha. So, they did the movie. The movie was more of a logical outgrowth. They just said, hey, let's use a TV budget and redo a bunch of stuff from the show as a film, a kind of a big old celebration of it. But there were, what was it, three revivals all told? Three revivals. Yep, the 85 one, the 2002 one, and most recently the 2019 one. Did that get renewed? Are they still doing that this year? I don't think so. There's no mention of it. Yeah, it... Look, it's CBS it made a huge splash. It, here's the thing. CBS is trying to revive the series, but they were also trying to drag new people to their streaming service. Which... Uh, CBS all access. The, yeah. If they haven't killed the goose that laid the golden next leg, egg, the the goose that laid the golden egg yes. that was Netflix streaming, they're gonna. Because they're basically putting out so many streaming services that it's like cable now. There's no... You've ruined the point of it. But yeah, it's... Also, if I remember correctly, with the 2019 when it made a huge splash, it had Jordan Peele... Fresh off his success with um, Get, Get Out. Out, and people were all talking about him, and people were talking about the first episode, and then the first episode came out, and the critics loved it, and a whole lot of audience members, myself included, went, wow, that was dumb. And then the second episode came out, and it wasn't terrible. Uh, that was the one we are going to watch, and I didn't watch anything beyond that because other things happened, but people stopped talking about it. Like, and no one's, one's, them doing no it. one's buying CBS All Access. Yeah. Like, so everybody talked about, wow, they're doing a new Twilight Zone. And then everyone was talking about, wow, what a pretentious first episode. And then everyone was saying, oh, they're doing Nightmare at 20,000 feet, but it's 30,000 feet now. And then nothing. Nothing. I didn't hear a blip about it on, on any, of the, any of the circles I run in. We'll, we'll, we'll get to We'll it. get to that. So up next, we're doing the 85 Revival. Whose idea was this? Who is responsible for the 85 Revival? I'm not sure, we're but... We're finding out. But this is cool, because we're doing Wordplay, which uh, was directed by Wes Craven. Okay. That is the Wes Craven of Nightmare on Elm Street fame. Which, and we'll do an episode on these... Yeah, Nightmare on Elm Street kind of has the reputation of having double-digit sequels getting goofier and goofier with more puns. Go back and rewatch the original Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, he directed the original Nightmare on Elm Street, the original <laughs> yeah. Scream. He also did others, too. You know, Wes Craven's New Nightmare. But go back and rewatch the original. It's scary. It, it, with one or two minor moments aside, 
It holds up. The man knows scary. He also knows, hey, they're paying me stupid amounts of money to keep doing these sequels. So The funny thing is, he always <laughs> wanted to be... Um, he always wanted to do romantic... Movies. Did he ever do a romantic movie? Uh, I see one of them on his on it. Paris J. Tam Tami. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, there was a little bit of romance in Nightmare on Elm Street. I'm your boyfriend now, Nancy. Because <laughs> he's a child. Molester. I don't know. I think it, I think it's him. I I don't I don't know if it's him or the guy who directed Halloween. All right, Twilight Zone, uh, 1985, first of the three revivals. Uh, ran for two seasons on CBS, which makes sense. It ran on CBS originally. Um, it was create. Oh, Rod Serling did this. Rod Serling revived his own show. Really? It wasn't narrated by him. It was narrated by no. Ah, mm. okay. This says created by Rob Serl Rod Serling based on his previous 1959 show. I don't know if that just means he gets credit for creating the idea. It was narrated by Charles Aidman and Robert Ward. Who's the producer? That's what I'm finding out. Oh my god, George R. R. Martin wrote five episodes? You gotta remember, George R. R. Martin got his start on the Beauty and the Beast TV show. Um, theme music composer, opening theme. Whatever, we're just kind of rambling now. We are. The point is, they made this, uh, and we're gonna watch... <laughs> Here we go. I found it. After the original Twilight Zone series ended in 1964, Rod Serling sold the rights to the series to CBS, which allowed for a revival of the show by the network. The network did this. Studio heads did this. So CBS has been trying to do this for a while. They have, and they keep... It never lasts as long. The original one lasted five seasons, and this one only lasted two. And more than a few episodes were revisiting earlier concepts. Although, ooh... They got Harlan Ellison. <laughs> this is hilarious. The show's producers have, had even managed to hire Harlan Ellison, which was considered by many to be nothing short of miraculous, as Ellison was an extremely vocal critic of television who had already published two collections of essays on the subject, concluding that to work in television is akin to, is akin to putting in time in the Egyptian house of the dead. We need to do something with Harlan Ellison later, though, uh, because that guy did some screwed-up stuff. The author of Psycho, Robert Bloch, described Ellison as the only living organism I know whose natural habitat is hot water. He wrote, I have no mouth and I must scream. Jeez. I have no mouth and I must scream is one of the most terrifying and revolting short stories I have ever read. It is pure existential nightmare mixed with warmed over body horror. We'll touch on that later. For now, we're doing the 1985 revival made by the network. Here we go. Um, Directed by Wes Craven. Here is wordplay. Woohoo! All right, so slight correction. That was actually the first segment of. Episode, uh, what, what episode was it? Episode two? First segment of episode two, season one of the revival, because the revival episodes were an hour long with different 20 minute segments. Um, you picked this on purpose, didn't you? Yes, I did. Um, you this is also, this is one, monument. The, <laughs> this is one, the only one I've seen, and two, it's, it's, Hilarious. It is all right. <laughs> I warmed to this because this episode was genuinely infuriating me at first, and I warmed to it. And I think I like it now that I've seen it. I also haven't watched a lot from the '85 revival. I saw a couple of episodes that were on TV uh, back when I was a kid, and I gotta say, I wasn't a fan of them. They seemed cornball. Yeah. Not even creepy, just cornball. The premise in this episode is that a completely ordinary guy, and it's foreshadowed cleverly, I'll grant. Regular guy at a sales agency, trying to learn a whole bunch of fancy new medical names for all the fancy new medical equipment they're selling and having a hard time doing it. The world's changing around him. He doesn't know what's wrong, what's wrong with all the old medical stuff they were selling. And then he notices that people are casually saying the wrong words. They'll say, I'm going to this restaurant for dinosaur instead of lunch. And the thing is, 
And gradually it turns into they're saying every word wrong. They'll say a sentence of total gibberish, but mean it. And the credit to the actors, you believe they're saying something meaningful. I'm sure they had a script that said what they were actually saying yeah. in addition to what they were saying. And it's harder to do. You'll hear some people on sci-fi speaking an alien language, and they obviously don't mean anything by it, and some mean something, and these guys meant something. The concept is solid. The concept is no goofier than the doll that a guy's stepdaughter brings home, turns out to be alive, and decides to kill him. I think the problem was, for me, the execution early on is so goony and corny. <laughs> yeah. Because, of course, the word and doesn't change, or, or some random word doesn't change. No, no, no. He gets to have a conversation where the guy says, oh, I'm taking a girl out for dinosaur. Can you recommend any places? But credit to the actor, he, he sells it. When he goes home to his wife and she says that their boy wouldn't eat his dinosaur, and he says, why are you saying dinosaur instead of lunch? And she says, why would you say lunch? And he asks her, what does it mean? And finally, he's reduced to screaming, tell me what lunch means. And we find out it means pink. You believe his frustration. And that'd be frustrating. I'd be frustrated. And the breakdown of language comes, like, the complete breakdown of language comes at the ultimate climax moment where the kid is sick. The child comes down with what they think is pneumonia at the exact moment that his wife is speaking in random gibberish, and he's speaking normally, and to her, he's speaking gibberish. And that is a classic Twilight Zone episode. A man is convinced that the world has gone insane, but the world doesn't realize anything's gone wrong. That's a solid premise. And once they commit to it, once they stop doing the shtick, and it actually is, he's the only human being on Earth who isn't speaking random gibberish, and no one can understand him, it works. Then it becomes the Twilight Zone. It, it, it stops feeling like a bad SNL skit. Because <laughs> it did. <laughs> the first half of this is a bad SNL skit, as if they aren't all bad. Oh, um, well, But once they commit to it, it works. And then at the end, when that narrator comes in, who... Credit where credit's due, he's not trying to be Rod Serling, so it, it kind of works. He's no, He is no Rod Serling, but, but he sounds fine. He's passable, he's good. Yeah. And it becomes clear that this is the point of this story is about how lost you can feel when the world changes around you. And we've all seen this. It's a recurring thing in fiction is, is a man wakes up and the world has changed in a way that he wasn't prepared for. And what was acceptable at his age isn't acceptable anymore for reasons that don't make sense. I feel this, and I'm in my 20s. Um, don't leave me hanging here. But, I I don't know, I, I, I feel this is a very, I feel this is a very, I, I feel it's a nice story, I feel it fails in execution in some areas. But I feel it ultimately wraps up in a nice bow. I did say when watching this, Wes, you'd need a guy like Wes Craven to be able to take this seriously enough to direct it and give it any sense of fulfillment. I mean, this is the guy who said, yes, implicit child molester, burned face, dream demon serial killer. That's my masterpiece. <laughs> and actually made that work. <laughs> that shouldn't have worked. Freddy Krueger shouldn't have worked. He's wearing a fedora and a Christmas sweater and has a knife glove. But he's scary. He was the nightmare of a generation until they ran him into the ground. So, and credit to the actors, it... Again, I've only seen two or three other episodes from this, but it feels to me like a microcosm. I butchered that word. It's a prime example of the concept of trying to remake The Twilight Zone. Yeah. You can make something that works... But it's going to feel like you're trying to do something that was done better. And if you fail, you'll seem all the goofier for falling short of the mark. Still... That is not to never say try to try to bring something back or... Have new ideas, man. I mean, I, here's the thing. If, some, if, there, if there are properties that can be improved upon by having a remake... I think that's due justice, and they should, because there are some stories that need to be told more correctly. Um, Someone once said, the worst way to love something is to love it just enough to wish they'd done it better. Usually this is referring to fiction, you know? Yeah. Uh, the Aragon movie 
it's just good enough that you wish it had been actually done well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's... But then again, certain things are good enough that you have to ask, why remake it? Well, the answer was more people wanted to tell the stories. And with the Twilight, answer was that Disney wanted to remake The Lion King because they wanted more money. Okay, yeah, I was trying to avoid the lion in the room. The <laughs> Twilight Zone, though, yeah, probably part of it was some CBS... Some CBS, not CBS, some CBS network did all the coke in the world and then said, I want to make more money. But with Twilight Zone, I can get why you try to remake it. It's an anthology. There was no recurring story. And anthologies you know, aren't not working today. No, there are. So you can understand wanting to make more stories, but I feel like, maybe I'm a pariah here, after 85, after the 2002, and now again in 2019, it starts to feel less like we feel such a love for this franchise that we should do more with it. And I'm sure some people did. I'm sure Wes Craven did love it. I'm sure Jordan Peele does love Twilight Zone. But it starts to feel like the motive was, if we put the name of this beloved thing on our works, people will watch our works. Yes. Take risks, creators. Okay, what's next? What's What was the next attempt at this? So we're, we're not done. That was the, the, the revival. Now we're doing the movie, which came before that. We're not going to do the whole movie because it's long and this episode's running long enough already, but we're going to watch the prologue and the movie's remakes of Kick the Can, Nightmare 20,000 Feet, and then the epilogue. Uh, there were a few directors on this movie. The prologue and the epilogue were directed by John Landis. Kick the Can was directed by Steven Spielberg. Makes sense. It's a beautiful episode, vaguely sad, nostalgic. Boy, what does he do well? <laughs> yeah, right. vaguely sad, nostalgia. <laughs> I, I think I think he's well suited for Kick the Can. We'll see how he how he tries and it. Nightmare at Twenty Thousand Feet, directed by George Miller. Now, George Miller is the director of Happy Feet, Happy Feet Two, Babe, Babe, Pig in the City, and the Mad Max franchise. His baby. He got the inspiration by working in the ICU unit of a hospital and thinking, wow, these horrific in injuries would fit in in the apocalypse. Let's make some exploitation movies. And then they were amazing. And the new one was amazing. New. It's like, what, seven years old now? Yeah, really. But the newest one. And you're going to... Yeah, Mad gonna, Max, Rise of the Furries. I'm going to beat you <laughs> with a sock full of pennies. Anyway... What, what prompted that? Because I thought of Furry Road, and then I thought Rise of the Furries. <laughs> Someone's going to hear this and make that, and you're going to have to take oh, accountability no. for it. Oh, I have guilt on my conscience. Ancient sins. All right, let's watch the movie. Okay, so... Twilight Zone, the movie. It came out before uh, the revival. We didn't watch the whole thing because, you know, time constraints, but what we did watch was segments two and four, the remakes of... Um, Kick the Can and Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. And also we watched the prologue, Something Scary, and the epilogue, Even Scarier, both of which were directed by John Landis. <laughs> uh, who was also a producer of this, along with Steven Spielberg, the director of Kick the Can. Let's start with Kick... Well, let's start with the prologue. Okay. So we've got we've got Dan Aykroyd and... Who's the other guy? Guy who... Albert voiced, Brooks. Yeah, guy who voiced Marlon. The guy who voiced Marlon the Fish from Finding Nemo, and Dan Aykroyd is the passenger. Uh, and they're driving along. It, it, it's pretty obvious. It's kind of goofy. I think what works about Twilight Zone, the movie that didn't work about a lot of the revivals. It's kind of winking at itself. It, well, because they knew what they were doing. It's, hi, I'm Twilight Zone, the movie. And usually I hate when things wink at themselves like the Marvel movies do. But in this case, I think it worked because when it wants to be serious, it's serious. But it, 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 it recognized that people were going to think it was goofy. So it said, okay, let's actually be goofy. It doesn't pretend to be a serious thing and then refuse to take itself seriously. It's just a goofy kind of thing. Yeah. Although segment one, which we didn't cover, um, is a partial remake of Death's Head Revisited and a partial remake of um, A Quality of Mercy. Uh, and that one's fairly serious, although not as well executed as either of them. And that one also uh, resulted in the deaths of two child actors, uh, the footage of which got cut from the movie for obvious reasons. Oh, no. Yeah. 
um, during a Vietnam War scene, a plane crashed, apparently, and um, it was a bit of a tragedy when this came out. But, so yeah, the, the fun thing with something scary is there's these two guys driving along on a road trip. One They've clearly met recently because they say, well, I know where you're from. Sure, I know where you're from. Um, and they're playing Cre- Creedence Clearwater Revival's Midnight Special, which I love that song. Tape messes up. One of them flips the light, the headlights off, and it's like, I'm going to play chicken until we hit something. And I was like, no, no, that's scary. And then he goes, actually, this is the passenger. He says, you want to see something scary? Sure. Okay, pull the car over. All right, you ready for it? And then he turns into a monster and attacks the guy. Yeah. And then we get the Twilight Zone theme. And then we get the narration done by Burgess Meredith, who was an actor in the classic Twilight Zone episode, Time Enough at Last, the guy who loves to reuse glasses break. Which they mention, they start talking about the Twilight Zone. That's how you know right off the bat, cards on the tables. Cards on the table. That this isn't just Twilight Zone episodes, it's also a celebration of it. It's a love letter to the Twilight Zone that's going to have a little fun with itself. Because they're saying, oh hey, you remember the Twilight Zone? Yeah. Uh, Remember that episode with Burgess Meredith, and then Burgess Meredith is the narrator? Yeah. I think Burgess Meredith works as a narrator for a reason a lot of other narrators don't. I said the guy from the 80s revival he's not was trying possible. to be scary. He's just, he's just having fun with it. He's just Burgess Meredith. He's Hi, just, I'm Burgess Meredith. You want to see a guy freak he's out just, on an airplane? He's just the best actor. <laughs> so he's he's having... You're fun. a Bob Rock! Stop it. He's having so much fun being that... You can tell with every line he's reading, he's like, I get to narrate the Twilight Zone. Yeah. And it works. Uh, okay, you love Kick the Can... Kick the Can, directed by Steven Spielberg. Uh, so, I I give it I give it I I give it I I, I liked it. I, I it, 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 there's a hesitation. It, it, there's a lot of things I didn't like about it though. So I I like sort of the setup, and I like that it starts kind of the same way. I like that it's the whole family rejecting him instead of just the son. It makes it even. But here's the thing, and they and they have a line in there, like... They mention that every two weeks he backs up and he goes down to his son's car, and every two weeks he walks back and unpacks. Yeah, which, it only, we only see the one instance of it in the show, in the, in the original show. And it's so, implied that he had his hopes all worked up, that, oh my god, my son's coming to take me home, and then his son's like, well, wait a minute, I didn't say that, I said we'd talk about it, Dad. Yeah. And it's all, de- and it... You can feel his anticipation leading up to the moment of it. He's just like, my son's going to pick me up. <laughs> and, he, and he just... And then he deflates. And he's like, well, sure. And if this is happening on a consistent basis, you said, yeah, it makes it more tragic, but less... Less poignant. Less poignant. And it's, more, it's, it's less poignant because it's a routine thing. There's a tragedy to the fact that the man... That his routine is getting rejected by his son. And that he keeps trying to do it. But it is, it becomes... Also, what a... Oh, you, well, you feel for the son, the, the son's kind of an ass, but on the other hand, it, not to judge the guy, but it starts to become pathetic almost, doesn't it? Yeah. A little bit. And then it turns out that he's the angry guy instead of the most uplifted guy. Which is almost clever. I don't think it is clever, but I can see what they're trying I don't. I don't think it's clever either. It just makes me less wanting him to earn the thing at the end. Because in the original, his getting rejected by the son is the moment that kicks him off into thinking, I've got to get something of my childhood back, and the miraculous kick-the-can game that turns them into children. Whereas... With Steven Spielberg here, he made a magic character. There's the... Ma- <laughs> he, 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 I, it's weird that it's a trope, but it's the magical black guy. Okay, well, I, here's the thing. Here's the thing. It's 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 a wise old guy with a wink in his eye who has a little bit of magic in his hands. Um, Who's and there's a clever little foreshadowing where they say where they ask him how many how many homes have you been in and he says oh six or eight homes, which makes you think he keeps getting thrown out of them, but it's actually because he's the fairy godfather of old people. I don't know what the point was, but like he's magic. He's magic. He's a magic character. He's retirement home Willy Wonka. Yeah, and he gets he gets people to find their youth again. Not in not in their bodies. He does turn them into children briefly, but like in their hearts and in their minds. And it's again, it's it's a it's an inherent problem 
or quality. I don't know if I want to call it. It's an inherent quality of remakes where they try to say, well, this was left unaddressed in the original. Let's address it. And in this, the thing they address is, once you're turned into a child, isn't it possible an 80-year-old suddenly finding themselves seven would say, wait a minute, I don't want to go to high school. I don't want to fall in love with someone and watch them die again. I was happy being old. I just wanted to dance. And yeah, that's a possibility. And I get why Spielberg decided to address it, but... It doesn't... It, it, it's the, only trying to serve the same exact message, and it's not doing that because it's just extending the runtime. By it's, addressing the things that were left unaddressed, but leaving the message the same, you weaken the message. Yeah. If they change, if they because gone, it just feels like they're padding for something. If they'd gone full cynicism and and decided that age really was inevitable and that you can't be young again, it would have been depressing. But I can see why they added that in. But in the end, all they do is make them become young again and show them become young. Credit to the child actors. A couple of little seven-year-old girls talk with the exact cadence of an eighty-year-old <laughs> Jewish woman. <laughs> it's amazing, but. Then all but one of them becomes old again, but stays young at heart. And it's like, I... That's a more realistic message, I suppose. I suppose, but... but... What's the point? What was the point of the magic, then? I think... I think it's better because it's also more self-contained in the first one. Yeah. It's really a lot of dialogue between two characters. That you really get a rapport for. the old people are the ensemble, the rest of the old people are the Right, and I liked that they gave the old people a a feeling, but the problem was, because it was still basically a 20-minute thing, you give these old people all personality traits, but then that's all you had time for. Yeah. So they all have the one personality trait. That was, like, qualified by two minutes of something. And in one case, the personality trait was, holds a cat. Holds a cat. Which does get the cute payoff that when she turns young, she's still holding the cat. <laughs> but that's what it was. Um, All right. So when the one stays young and goes off shouting about Sherwood Forest, you don't know why you're supposed to care that it was him. I guess because he was the one who wanted to dance with the old lady? I don't know. I said during the episode, I don't like the concept of the magical old black guy going from nursing home to nursing home because it weakens the premise, but I did like the actor's execution of it. He's a likable performance. Yes, he's a likable... Even if he's a pointless character. Yeah. I, I think... I think there's some elements that are, that are iconic Spielberg in this. Uh, it almost what? felt like Spielberg doing Spielberg, if that makes sense. Yeah, it almost felt like him copying his own style. Yeah! <laughs> I don't know. Which is weird. The bubbles! Out of nowhere, old guy blowing bubbles! Filling the whole screen. I don't know. Maybe I've gone... No, he started way. blowing bubbles in the meeting when they were talking about nutrition. Jeez. In the yeah. beginning of the episode. Which, is he senile? Is he, I don't know. Maybe I've gone. Maybe I've gone cynical in my youth. In, in my old youth. Dude, I'm gonna... God help anyone who has to talk to me when I hit 90. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, right so, so the next one I actually do like. Nightmare. With the caveat that I think the original Nightmare 20,000 Feet is better. Yeah. But, okay, they got John Lithgow to play the main character in Nightmare 20,000 Feet, eliminated the wife, eliminated the nervous breakdown, and just made him a terrified guy who's scared of flying, which I relate to. I'm terrified of flying. Lithgow is a good actor, but he's not a subtle actor. We were astounded by how, how subtle the performance was in the other one, but in this one he's not playing it subtly. And it works. It works but I, I think it, a lot of it's because of the camera work, too, because they get those huge wide-angle shots. And the Dutch angles. And yeah, the, and when he's especially pulling away from the from the window, yeah, you just see his face zoom zoom right it's in. It's great. Um, They're but that's these, a matter of knowing what you're doing. They got themselves a very hammy, but believable actor and said, okay, full ham. Yeah, and they pull off some really interesting, interesting visual things here. The updated design of the gremlin. Yeah. Which they brilliantly don't show you for the longest time. Most good horror, we touched on this in Krampus, a lot of good horror movies don't show you the monster, they hide it. I think what it what it lacks in I think I think what it lacks in dialogue and original subtlety, it makes up for in style. Yes. And how slick the camera work was in this one. Is it style over substance? Yes. 
but what good style? Yeah. And if you must be style over substance, you got to be stylish, and this is. I'm yeah, not... Tim Burton is only it, Tim Burton is successful in part because he's style over substance, and then substance over style. I think Tim Burton at his best is a perfect marriage of style and substance. At his worst, he's, he's style, style over substance. substance. Um, but, Beetlejuice's substance and style. But damn, if he, it's not interesting to look at every time. Which Tim Burton. Oh, I, I guess if you marathoned Tim Burton, it would be a little samey. But, like, Tim Burton, compared to everything else being made, is distinct. Yeah, yes. I, I, I'm, I'm only getting that because he has a distinct visual style that most everyone can identify. Sure, but then again, so does Spielberg. As we just noticed. Yeah. Spielberg's just isn't as bold. <laughs> okay. Um, so... The design on the... I'm not sure how I feel about the gremlin not getting shot on this. I like that it eats his gun. I like that the gremlin eats metal. Oh, yeah. That's why it's attacking the plane. I don't, I don't like... I, I, the, the, I, the cheeky finger the wag. The cheeky finger wag I didn't like, but I think that just that was just a step too far for me. Yeah, but then I, again, I get that the gremlin wanted to leave because they were about to land, and he didn't have time, but still, the cheeky finger wag was... It was... Fun. I think he should have ended it biting off a gun. Yeah, bite off the gun, realizes they're going to land, jumps away. And then just keeps smiling at him and jump away. And the creepy thing is, it's not a smile. That thing just doesn't have lips. Yeah. Ugh. They combined... They kept the idea of it being hairy, but they made it this skeletally thin... It's like the the, the, the monster from Alien without the penis head. And with a predatory horse face thing. This is weird. I don't Gross. know. Um, but it works. And I liked what I did like... Is, if there is a flaw in the original, other than the monster design, it's that he's kind of visibly panicking on a plane, mm -hmm. and nobody notices because they're all just asleep. Yeah. And in this, they play up the... If a guy was screaming about a man on the wing in a plane, people would freak. Yeah. And if an engine was being sabotaged on a plane, the plane would have some problems. So I like that they showed the plane suffering from the damage of the gremlin, even though it does tip the hand that the gremlin was real early on. I really wonder how they'll handle this type of a story in... Um, a post-9-11 world? Yeah, in 2019's version. We're going to find out Cause, shortly. Because my idea is somebody screams at something out the window, and then he gets tackled by an air marshal, and then the episode is over. Well, you got to remember, the airlines and, that do that get in trouble for it. Like, remember that guy who, who had a fit on a plane and got beaten and dragged off, and there was a minor national controversy for a week on the news. So they don't... They try not to... I mean, if you shout bomb on a plane, you're disappearing. But if you shout there's a man on the wing, they're going to tell you to keep your voice down and they're probably going to tackle you, but they might... They're going to assume you're crazy, not a terrorist, because what terrorist jumps up and says, there's a man on the wing? I don't know. They're definitely handcuffing you to your seat. Well, yeah, which they tried to do in this. Okay, so don't. Uh, so next up is the revival, and then the 2019 revival. So we got two more episodes in this thing to go. Good lord, and they're at least. Uh, so the 2002 revival, the monsters are on Maple Street. We talked about how they changed the title earlier in this. It was the monsters are due on Maple Street? This is the monsters are on Maple Street. Another combination... If they're on Maple Street, wouldn't the people on Maple Street be able to see the monsters on Maple Street? Not to give away the ending, but like, I mean, we know what they're saying. It's yeah. a dumb... I don't like the change because it does spoil it a little bit, but then again, if you don't know the twist, the monsters being on Maple Street, it could be like, well, the real Martian, please stand up, or we can't see him yet. Okay. But yeah, it's another combination, horror, social commentary. This is from the 2002 revival. It is... Season 1, episode 31, and it's directed by Debbie Allen. Let's go. Alright, so your thoughts. That was a waste of time. Pretentious. Ugh. Dull. It's, okay, everybody was lit like they were on a sick, like they were on... It was lit like a, not even a sitcom, it was like a soap opera. It was lit like a soap opera. It was shot like a soap opera. Shot like a sofa. Except when it did Dutch angles, and at, at one point they would have worked, but they use them too early. They were using them too early, and they all use them at once. And they used them at one point when they start the car, and it doesn't work. It's a Dutch angle, but then the next time it's not, and then it is. I'm reminded of a review of Battlefield Earth, which is terrible, where the, the reviewer said that the director has learned that better directors sometimes tilt their camera. 
but he hasn't learned why. <laughs> Forrest Whitaker as the host. I like Forrest Whitaker, but the problem is, A, you're distracted by the fact that it's Forrest Whitaker, and B, he does nothing. He just... It's not the matter-of-factness of Rod Sterling. It sounds like he's doing a cold read. Yeah, it sounds like he's just been given the script two minutes ago. He's reading it like it's a commercial for pain medication. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The, it's just... I admire what they wanted to. Okay, so the monsters are due on Maple Street. It was a classic episode of The Twilight Zone where the power goes out to an entire neighborhood at once, and over the course of the next few hours, the neighbors begin to panic and turn on each other, convinced that the power has been cut by an alien invader who is amongst them, and they need to root out the actual alien. Of course, the real aliens are waiting on a hilltop, having shut down the power, and are allowing the humans to destroy themselves, and this is their plan for taking down all of Earth. At which point Rod Serling says, unfortunately, in the real world, even without the aliens, the monsters are due on several neighborhoods, just like Maple Street. And I admire the idea that this came out in 2002, it's a post-9-11 world, instead of aliens, it makes sense that the fear would be terrorism. I get the transition, it's a logical transition. The problem is, somehow, the 60s version made aliens a more believable threat than this made terrorists. Because you don't believe that there's a threat! It's like everybody in this cast knows that they're in a horror movie except for the one drunk guy. The one guy who's playing the drunk racist asshole. Yeah, it's... oh man. And of course, instead of them all turning on each other, they all turn on the one outsider group, which, again, feels like it should be a pertinent message... And that's what they were going for, but the execution falls so painfully short because they get so precious little reason to do it. And they get caught up in a side plot that doesn't even matter. For some reason, they decide to take precious time away from establishing why they've all turned into an angry mob, complete with torches and pitchforks. But only they got a, a rake instead of a pitchfork. My god, that was stupid. Um, and they, they give us, like, a, a five-minute subplot about the new couple that just moved into the neighborhood and the dad didn't, well, the husband didn't want to, but the wife thinks it's a good place to start a child and they kiss in front of the fireplace and why? <laughs> Again, in the original one, it was all them outside, all them panicking. Yeah. And do you know what set off the riot in the original? Because in this, what, what set them off on attacking the house? Uh, one guy found a camera. Right, and before that they had power. It's a bizarre thing that tricks an entire neighborhood into saying, let's murder these people in their homes by burning the house down. Yeah, it's not. In the original one, what sets them off is a guy went over to the next block to see if they had power. Everyone forgot about him during the argument. He comes back and startles the guy with the gun who shoots him in a panic. At which point someone says, you must be the traitor, you killed him. And he says, no I'm not. And it turns into a riot. Yeah. That's believable. This was just, well, the script says we have to murder these people in their homes now. The only two genuinely scary things, even them being burned alive in their home isn't scary because they spend a weird 30 seconds peering out the front window refusing to come out while the house is inflamed. Before they get trapped in because someone throws a bomb through or a, a brick through the window at them, there's no reason why they wouldn't have fled the instant the fire went off. Even if there was a guy with a gun outside, the house is on fire. They're just like, wow. This is it's sick. weird. And we never see them, which it deliberately leaves it ba vague. Are they Middle Eastern? Are they just white people? Are they black? Are they Asian? Who knows? It's an interracial community with a black guy running the homeowners association and an Asian kid guy with his kids in the in the soccer team. But who knows? Are they Middle Eastern? Are they... Blonde, blue-eyed, American apple pie lovers, who knows, we never see them. Uh, which I guess is a... That's a clever thing. I'll give them credit for that. Um, but, Christ, I didn't like this. This leads nowhere, this is nothing. It, it's got a good message. You just go watch the original. But they shot the message. If not, don't shoot the messenger. Don't shoot the message. Nothing kills a good message like bad execution. Okay. Uh, there are two more things I want to talk about with this. The genuinely scary parts are that at the end, instead of it being aliens that set this up, it's the U.S. Army doing a civilian test. And, yeah, I can see, I can see the U.S. government 
recklessly testing things on American citizens. Jeez, uh, brought MK Ultra, the Tuskegee syphilis experiments, uh, the nuclear testing. The, the, the history of the U.S. government and the intelligence community is horrifying reckless shit being done to the American citizens. Okay. Um, the other scary thing was the Homeowners Association. Because nothing scarier than the Homeowners Association. <laughs> I want to talk about themes. The theme songs. The opening theme of The Twilight Zone is iconic. Yes. The theme song is iconic. The visuals are iconic. And here's the thing. Even though it came out in the 50s and 60s, it doesn't feel dated to them. You wouldn't be surprised if I told you that the tw- if I showed someone blind the theme, who had never heard of it before, I mean, not a blind person, the opening credits of the original Twilight Zone, you could convince them it was made in the 40s or the 50s. You could convince them it was made today in a deliberate attempt to be retro. The, the theme from the 80s revival isn't bad. It's got some good visuals, but it's, it's very 80s. Yeah, it's by the Grateful Dead. It's got Dead. the Grateful Dead. And they do what he said. The music's fine. The visuals are okay. The one from the movie is fun because they basically just said, let's do the TV show, but with updated graphics. That's not bad at all, especially for the product. The 2000s one has this gross, like, hair metal pop synth thing going on, and the visuals are all bright and electric-y. What did I say? It was painfully early 2000s. Early 2000s, alt rock and roll. Everything about this was just painfully dated to the early 2000s, and not because of the technology, but the way it was lit, the way it was shot, everything. Original Twilight Zone is dated because they're driving cars from that period. They're in black and white. They're in black and white. A a guy is able to bring a firearm onto an airplane just because he's a cop. Okay, sure. People are able to smoke indoors. Yeah, but it doesn't feel like... Aside from Dave Chappelle. It doesn't feel like it was... Filmed then. It's very timeless, aside from obviously these humans exist in this time period. But you could mistake it for something made today, set in the 50s. Yeah. 2000s revival wasn't. Now, I I didn't watch the anything in the 2019 one past the first episode because the first episode made me sad and kind of angry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're going to watch the 2019 version of Nightmare at 20,000 Feet, only now it's Nightmare at 30,000 Feet. I don't know if this is a remake or a revival. I don't don't know if it's a sequel. If it is, I'm interested to see what they do with the gremlin. I'm cool for a new... I'm always a slut for monster designs. Say what we you got will. our boy Adam Scott back from Krampus. Woo! And say what you will about Get Out, and I'll say my piece about that eventually, but the deer bone demon was cool. Oh, yeah. I wish they hadn't teased us with it in the trailer and then revealed it was just a hallucination. We'll talk about Jordan Peele's <laughs> personal projects later. He's a good filmmaker. I, I, I like I just it. don't like that one project of his. I personally like a lot of his stuff, and a lot let's more of his see, stuff than Peter does. But let's see what... Um, what well, 2019 Team has to has shove to down shove our throats. <laughs> <laughs> wow, uh, going into this with expectations. Let's let's give it a try. Wow, I I actually hate that more than I hated the first one, the 2019 I, one. Uh, <clears throat> um, I have I the 85 one didn't make me this angry at the beginning. The 2002 one's laziness didn't make me this angry. I. This is rage. Yeah, no, I was more angry at the 2001, but like... The 2002 one was lazy and pretentious. This but was... But it, hadn't, it had no sense... Like, at least this has a sense of style. I don't know. This was style. At least, it's, was, some, this at least was, it's something to look at. This wasn't stylish. This was well-filmed. There's a difference. Okay. I... Oh... I admired what the 2002 one was failing to say. Like, they were trying to say something and failed to say it. This said what they wanted to say, and what they wanted to say was stupid and gutless. So the story is... A man gets on a plane, he's had a PTSD mental breakdown before... Because he's an investigative journalist, and he was investigating something in Yemen, and what he saw there horrified him. Like you do. Um, and he gets on a plane, and he starts listening to this... What? 
Well, it's, a, it's I think it's an MP3. But the point is, he's listening to a horror podcast. Hey, hey, a real life horror podcast, They're like an unexplained mysteries thing, and it's talking about the tragic disappearance of Flight 1015, which is the flight, flight that he's on. Yep, with the same pilot name, and a bird hits the engine in the podcast at the same time, time that a bird hits the engine in the real one. And the people on the on the flight have the same names, and everything is lining up. And he becomes aware that the flight is going to disappear at exactly 11.15. And it's getting close, and he's got to save the plane. Here are my grievances. First, they cut the gremlin. They, they cut the gremlin. Unless you want to argue that Pete, the podcast was the gremlin, because it's never explained other than this is the Twilight Zone, they why the podcast a, tells the future. They gave they, you a wink to the... They gave us this cheeky thing that after the plane crashes, he comes to and he's staring at a child's toy that looks like the gremlin from the original one, and who would give their kid that? They never even made those. My other grievance, my, my next grievance... And I predicted this a third of the way in, and I thought to myself, if they, and I said this, if I do what I think they're going to do, I'm going to be very de- sad. The message of this pretentious little drivel is that his paranoia and panic that someone's going to bring down the plane is what brings down the plane, not a terrorist. It's actually a suicidal guy uh, who he gives access to the cabin. But the thing is, you cannot lecture us about not being afraid of weird Russian dudes or Middle Eastern sheiks, Sikhs, apologies, um, and how they're not all terrorists. And I agree with that message. I feel really bad that a bunch of guys from a religion that made them wear turbans suddenly had to face a bunch of scrutiny for stuff that a fringe group of extremists from a different religion did. That said... Don't lecture me that I'll be afraid of the Sikhs when the first time you showed the Sikhs, you showed them from a creepy Dutch angle with creepy low da-dun, da-dun music playing and the exact same angle you used to frame the Russian mafia member. It leads you into these... It leads you into these doors and slams you in the face with them and then uh, criticizes you for slamming your face in the In head. a door, yeah. You Don't set me up to think something using every cinematography trick in the book and then say, why did you think that? Because you told me to and Now, of course, me... neither of us are thinking of this because neither of us are stupid. Yeah. We're obviously, all, we're obviously all smarter than the script is, is wanting us to be. Yeah. I'm going to... Let's talk about the theme. The theme song in this is good. The visuals are good. They basically did the same thing the movie did. Take the visuals from the original and give them an update. And the update in this looks really cool. They did the the classic eyeball, but at first you think it's going to be the moon, and then the moon rotates and it's an eyeball. That's good. Jordan Peele is good as a narrator. He's not good in the theme, though, because he's trying to sound creepy. He's better in the narration because he just sounds like Jordan Peele talking. That's good. Credit where credit's due. But it's... And, and and to be fair, none of the acting is bad in any no, of these it's, episodes. It's well filmed. That's what pissed me off about the first one too. In the in the 2019, it's well filmed. It's, it's well, well filmed. It's well acted. It's well shot. Everything is well made, but the story is pretentious, gutless drivel. I the at the end of it, we find out because the podcast is still telling the future for some reason. Twilight Zone means you don't have to think, I guess. We find out that the only that the pa- all the passengers survived the wreck. After months, they were found on this remote island, and the only one who died was Sanderson, the reporter. And none of the passengers know what happened to him. And of course, all the passengers turn on him, and as a mob, beat him to death for getting the plane crashed. No reports of what happened to the actual suicidal guy he led into the plane, and why he's not being blamed for this or why no one ever admitted to murdering this guy, or why we're implicitly, by Jordan Peele's narration, meant to think it's right to kill him because he was paranoid. Even though he wasn't just a racist... They're trying to make us think he's some racist, paranoiac, convinced that there's a terrorist around every corner, but he has a podcast that's telling him the future, and the episode confirms time and again that it's accurately predicting the future. He's acting reasonably. So... This one made me mad. 
I because I get I get that I get that 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 tear from that source could be interesting. It, uh, a weird investigation of what's going to bring the plane down it could be interesting if you're just listening to a podcast. They made me feel bad for a journalist. <laughs> okay. How do you do that? I'll tell you how to do that. Terrible, terrible, pretentious writing. I don't share the same contempt for all journalists. <laughs> It's not all journalists. <laughs> I think I think the ones in that one movie, uh, what is it? The the one where uh, they release the scandal in the church or whatever. The one where Mark Ruffalo is in it. Oh yeah, that one's pretty good. Yeah, it's. I should I should I should modify my my statement here. I don't think that journalists are inherently bad. An attempt at topical humor here. Um, it's like that line from whose line is it anyway? Facts you wish were true. Yeah. The news. The news. <laughs> But this is... The episode thinks it's telling a different story than it's telling. It's preachy, but it it's, its message is contradicted by its narrative. Yeah. And its message is a stupid message. Its message is contradicted by its narrative in the way in such a way that it's it's just... It's undercut. Yeah, it cuts its legs off. And I... We're supposed to hate the guy getting beaten to death by a mob at the end while he screams that he tried to save them, and he did try to save them. He did it wrong, but like... But he did it the best he could, considering that he was a man with a nervous breakdown, dealing with a podcast telling him the future. But leaving it vague about how they all crash. And he's the monster. Yep. I don't... No, the monster... I don't understand the logic of this series. I understand the messages, and I understand and I understand the points of these. I just don't understand the, where... Because it comes back to... And I said this when we saw the, when we saw the poster for it. That new uh, Black Christmas they're making. Where they took a terrifying, nihilistic, depressing... Just emotionally gutting movie from the 70s and said, let's make it feminist. And the director said, I care more about the message than the story. Bam, that's what happened in 2019, Twilight Zone. They care more about the message than the story. Rod Serling could make a message Death's Head Revisited, the living doll, and incorporate it into, into a the good story, story intelligently because he was a good writer. It's... People have to put their stories first because if we don't care about the characters and we don't care about the plot and we don't care about any of that... But I did care about this character. They made me care about this character and then told me to hate him in the last 30 seconds. Exactly. It's not even a good he was the alien all along thing because I've seen it done where you care about a guy because you're with him but then at the end you realize he was actually the murderer and suddenly you hate him. They didn't do that though. They just said... Apropos of nothing, hate him because we must... N- now this plane has crashed. The problem with the post-9-11 world was that we swung into a verging upon racist paranoiac terror. And this has knee-jerk reactions swung in the other direction. Anyone who's even a little bit nervous, even with probable cause on a plane is the real monster. It's like how Ayn Rand grew up under Stalin and therefore thinks that private property is God. She knee-jerk swung in the opposite direction to no good to result. So... Let's wrap this up. Let's talk about the Twilight Zone so, and wrap so, this up so and get off of this. Let's, let's, wrap, let's wrap the 2019 up. Uh, good, good things to take away from this. Um, uh, don't be racist. Uh, <laughs> he wasn't even racist. <laughs> shush, shush, shush. Don't be racist and uh, stop listening to metaphysical things in your life. Just if you have a podcast that tells the future, ignore it and read a cheap pulp magazine. And don't tell ethnic people to, to Sikhs to turn their phones off on airplanes, or karma will punish you. I guess. <laughs> Jordan Peele is charismatic. Digital photography makes for good filmmaking. I think. 
This one made me sad. Don't worry, Peter. We're almost asleep. <laughs> okay, so this has been the Twilight Zone. It amazing series back from the 50s and 60s that they keep trying to recapture, and a couple of times they came close. Will it ever? Will, it, will we ever get a Twilight Zone again? No. No, we won't. And I'm going to say we shouldn't try to. Will we still have the Twilight, the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror until the end of time? Because we don't have it in California anymore, Peter. Do we not? No. Uh, we only have it in the Hollywood studios. Well, then, yes, until they decide it's not profitable. The Outer Limits was successful because they said, hey, let's do a scary anthology show. Tales from the Crypt was successful. Because they said, hey, let's do a scary anthology show. And by the same by the same merit, Black Mirror is successful. Because they said, let's do a scary anthology show. About technology. Goosebumps, let's do a scary anthology show for kids. None of them said, let's do the Twilight Zone. They did the Twilight Zone. And they did it really well. The movie worked because it was a love letter. The 80s one could work because... They were throwing some things at the wall. To see and what would stick. Yeah. The 2002 one didn't work because, well, it was too much of a product of its time and it was too lazy. And the 2019 one doesn't work because it's pretentious. Because it's trying to say to it's trying to say things before it tells a story. Yeah. They married a message and didn't write a story. So, but then again. Like people have said, no matter how many terrible remakes they make of your favorite property, your favorite property still exists. Yeah. The real horror <clears throat> is that in 50 years, we're all going to wake up and Disney will have announced Batman v. Darth Vader 3, The Twilight Zone Strikes Back. <laughs> and the doctor is just going to run out of drugs to prescribe me to get me to sleep. I already, I already thought we reached maximum uh, falling in on yourself when uh, Steven Spielberg or, or, or whatever his name was uh, released that movie, uh, Ready Player One. Where the trailer literally opens with the main character saying, ah, I wish it was the 80s. <laughs> Boom, nostalgia the film. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Speaking of scary stuff, and the, it was the 70s, next week, let's go back to an original horror property that has been sequeled and remade to death. Let's talk about the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oh, are we going to get some leather faces? And some leather-bound books? <laughs> we'll make chili. <laughs> We're going to drink... Uh, I'm going to wear a nice leather whiskey. jacket the whole time. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, horror fans, uh, thank you for staying with us so long. Uh, I have been ghastly. I have been gruesome. We've been the Graveyard Ghouls. This has been the Twilight Zone in all its iterations. Good, Good night. Lord.